Uh, I'm going to try to tell a story, too. I will not do anywhere near as good a job. But uh, I have a, a, f a fantastic team of wonderful graduate students who work with me at the University of Washington. And the story I'm going to tell you about today is uh, a story that uh, hi highlights the work of one of those students, Brian Dorenzi, who spent some time in uh, Tanzania uh, a little while ago. And in specifically in a, in a town in southern Tanzania, near the Mozambique border, called Mtwara. Uh, just for scale, that box is about two miles across. You can see it's a pretty beautiful spot, nice beaches, but it's, uh, in fact, we have great pictures of Brian sitting on those beaches. Um, but it's a pretty poor place, and uh, mostly surrounded by a very rural agricultural uh, environment. And, uh, you know, this is a typical street in that town. And you can imagine that if you get sick in a place like this, you might have uh, some issues f finding the right, uh, the right health care. Um, just to give you a sense of comparison here, these are numbers that are published by the World Bank. And they list the number of doctors per 1,000 people. And I've just picked some uh, countries out of the list. Uh, turns out Cuba is the highest almost six doctors per thousand. Tanzania is the lowest out of the 200 some odd countries we have on the globe. And, uh, you know, those numbers are pretty stark, but, you know, they're all kind of three digits. They look the same. And what I did is I just took the reciprocal of those numbers and said, well, how many people per doctor is that? And that starts to look quite a bit different. So we're going to a place that has one doctor for every 50,000 people. That would be like Seattle having a total of 20 doctors. Okay. And there, you know, there's more than that in one office at UW Medical Center. So kind of an interesting situation. So if you're a parent with a sick child and you have to go and get some care for that child, it's, uh, it's pretty unlikely you're going to find a doctor right when you need him. So the more common situation is that you'll find a nice uh, clinician in a local clinic who's had some training but is by no means a registered nurse, by certainly not a doctor. And to help these folks out in trying to give that child the best care possible, there are organizations that are trying to do some things to help out, like, for example, the World Health Organization that is part of the United Nations. So they publish protocols, uh, flowcharts, that tell you what to do with a sick child. So it's a paper manual. You know, when people complain, you know, I get a child to take home, it doesn't come with a manual. Well, yes, it does, actually. And this is one of them. And uh, this one is called the Integrated Management of Childhood Illnesses. And uh, it basically is a set of questions to ask, things to observe, and uh, what the conclusions might be from them. Often, what the conclusion is a next step. Go to another page and ask another question. You can, I don't know if you can read that, but in that first box on the left-hand side, it says, you know, find out if, count the breaths in one minute, but the child must be calm. You can imagine a child with a raging ear infection might not be so calm. But, uh, you know, this chart continues on and on, and you're flipping through this paper and trying to find what the conclusion's going to be and what advice you should give the mother. Because here's the most important part. If the child is really seriously ill, you got to get them to a referral hospital and try to get them to see that scarce doctor. If they're not, you want to send them home with the right advice for the mother. Right, how to take care of this child. Often, that's a dehydration uh, issue. And so you want to figure out how to, give, how to keep a child hydrated who's vomiting after anything goes in their stomach. So not, not an easy thing to figure out how to do. And, uh, so, you know, when we think about this context then, you know, we have, we're basically doing triage. We're trying to figure out who gets to see the doctor and who doesn't, and do this as an effective and correct a way as possible. Uh, we want to send the easily treatable kids home uh, and have them taken care of by their own parent, uh, not occupy the time of the doctor, uh, and then get the seriously ill children to the hospitals. The important thing is doing this accurately and quickly. Now, what happens in the real situation is that you have a sick child that's likely crying, very concerned mother in a fairly 
You know, they've just been waiting in line for hours. Uh, you walk into a room and you have a clinician with a paper manual and a ledger to write some things down in. And you can imagine the thought going through this mother's uh, mind, right? Uh, I have a sick child here and you're going to use a paper manual to figure out what's wrong? Uh, you know, that, that doesn't exactly inspire deep confidence in the process. On top of it, the clinician does have limited medical training and they can't really wing it. They need that paper manual. But there's a lot of social pressure to put that manual down. And the result is that the clinician tries to do this stuff from memory. You know, they've seen a lot of kids. Maybe they'll just wing it and go through what they remember as that process. What happens from that is that you get incomplete or incorrect advice given to the mother. And uh, you might be doing the wrong things or not enough things when that child is at home. Worse yet, you might make some errors in that triage and you might have a seriously sick child not make their way to a doctor. On top of that, you probably aren't going to have time to write anything down in that ledger. And certainly not when you ask the questions and take the measurements of the child. So you're going to come up with incomplete records at best uh, of that whole visit. And if that child comes back later, you're not going to have accurate stuff to refer back to and find out how things are going. Are they worse? Are they better? So let's imagine now a slightly different situation where we still have our mother and child coming into the clinic, but now we uh, introduce some technology, the big blue arrow, pointing to a cell phone-like device. Okay? And what we're going to do with this device is uh, actually put that entire flowchart into that electronic form. So that now, rather than going through a paper manual and leafing through to find the right place to go based on the answers to the questions, we can have, the, we can have this technology do that for us. Okay? So the, another nice advantage of this is that we can see the answers that we gave to the previous questions that the form asked us about, that the protocol asked us. So we can kind of see the context of how we got to the particular a uh, set of questions that we're dealing with right now. And this is actually quite helpful to the clinicians because they kind of see the train of thought that's behind that protocol. Hard to get out of paper, okay, and a 35, 40-page booklet. So now we have a very similar situation as before, but we've replaced that paper manual with a mobile device. We don't have a ledger anymore. We just have that phone. And we have the exact same protocol, so we're doing the same things the UN wants us to do uh, for, for a childhood uh, diagnosis. But the result is quite a bit different. In the result, we now have a clinician that follows the protocol on the phone. It's easier than leafing through the paper and possibly socially more acceptable to use some modern technology to help us through uh, that process and might be more acceptable. Um, the incomplete or incorrect advice that previously we were giving hopefully now is, is, uh, is better and more complete because we're not relying on memory anymore. The device is actually giving us, spelling that out clearly and letting us uh, read that out. Uh, hopefully we're making fewer errors in that triage function. And another nice thing is as we answered those questions, we've been keeping a record of the visit so that the data collection is already done. As the process of, of going through that process. We don't have to sit down and do it separately. So now we have a better record of what happened uh, here so that next time we can do a better job. So the results then of this very simple intervention are that now we have 25% more of the cases adhering to the protocol. That's one out of every four children getting hopefully uh, more accurate and better information about their situation and their mother being able to do better for them. And the other thing that we measured was how does this change the amount of time because you have to have the same throughput or better of children. And we found that that was pretty much uh, unaffected, just a slight difference. And if you want to find out a lot more about this, there's a nice paper written by Brian that appeared in the, uh, uh, the uh, CHI conference in 2008. Uh, that's the Computer Human Interface Conference. Okay, another nice advantage of going through this kind of, uh, using this kind of system is now, because that record is in the device, 
the clinicians can actually review the cases with each other and actually start to learn a little bit more by collaborating and seeing what the results were of a particularly difficult case and how it ended up. So now there's also an increased uh, understanding of the situation that was hard to reconstruct when we had to do things leafing through paper in front of, in front of the, that mother and crying child and not being able to really capture that process. So now we're turning our attention to how do we take that information that we managed to capture and also display it for the next clinician that will see this child. So they will be able to find the patient in a database, bring up that information about their previous visits, and see how they've been doing over time. We're also looking at turning this mobile phone into a more, um, more of a medical instrument in its own right. At the top here, uh, is an actual existing product for the iPhone that actually will record heart and lung sounds and actually help you capture uh, what you're, what's going on with that person right then. And you can imagine adding that to the, to the record can be really useful in com doing a comparison the next time. What we're also looking at is using the camera on the phones uh, to you know, look in the ear and see how that child is uh, doing maybe with an ear infection. Uh, we'd like to be able to have, since we have a person that's not medically trained, uh, we'd like to have that phone help them get the right picture, point it in the right direction, make sure that it sees an eardrum, and then even be able to start to classify what that eardrum looks like and whether there's an infection there, or how serious that infection is, and what course of action should be taken. So we can start thinking about the phone not just being the paper manual, but being a whole doctor's office kits worth of equipment, okay, and all in one single device. So I want to, you know, th this is our tagline for some of this work. What we're trying to do is magnify these limited human resources that we have in these, in these uh, developing world settings through the introduction of technology. So we want to be able to capture interesting data in the healthcare system, inter help interpret that data, and then provide the appropriate advice to make up for that lack of trained personnel so that hopefully we can leapfrog and get beyond that one doctor for 50,000 people and move ahead. So uh, lastly, I just want to make a plug for the change group at the University of Washington, which is an interdisciplinary group of people interested in the problems of development generally and also healthcare in particular, among other topics, in the developing world. And, uh, please visit our website. There's a lot more interesting projects there. Thank you very much.